Sudan here, your Sudan was broke up by this problem because your, your people in the north, they said they were Arabs. When you look at them, you try to see how, how Arab they are, you don't see. You see a black man saying he's an Arab. But, but, but I don't see your Arabism. No, I am an Arab. Okay, that's your problem. In the last 500 years, Africa has had the problem of the slave trade, has had the problem of colonialism, has had, has had the problem of neocolonialism, of marginalization, of underdevelopment, of dictatorships, of civil wars, of failed states, of starv starvation and death, of refugees. All of these have been happening in the last 500 years to the Africans. By 1900, the whole of Africa had been colonized, except for Ethiopia. So we must ask ourselves, what is the problem? What is the problem? That is a very good question. And who better to answer it than the man himself, Mr. President Yauri Museveni. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's good to see you today on the Speak and See Show. Like, subscribe, click that notification button so when I get information out, you can get information in like this, like warnings, a large-scale massacre in Africa, and we don't even get a 15-second YouTube short or a TikTok video on it. So much to talk about in so little time. I am going to go over this Museveni speech that he just gave you. I clipped it down where it was 10 minutes, so it's only five, but he doesn't miss a word. I just cut out those long pauses, you know, that Mr. Vini likes to have in the middle of the speech to give you time to think. Well, you're not gonna have time to think about this. You're just gonna have time to grab a drink and tell me what you think about what Museveni says the problem is. In the last 500 years, Africa has had the problem of the slave trade has had the problem of colonialism, has had, has had the problem of neocolonialism, of marginalization, of underdevelopment, of dictatorships, of civil wars, of failed states, of starv starvation and death, of refugees. All of these have been happening in the last 500 years to the Africans. By 1900, the whole of Africa had been colonized except for Ethiopia. So we must ask ourselves, what is the problem in Africa? Why could people who are the original stock of the human beings be in all these problems? In the last 50 years, almost, 50, almost 60 now, I've been active on the African scene. I've been watching. They are essentially three problems which I have seen. Problem number one, misuse of identity. I am a Catholic. In Uganda we had that problem. When we got independence, our leaders got it wrong. Even before independence they had started because they didn't have what to tell the people to go to a hospital when you, when you are not a doctor and then, and then patients come. You are not able to understand the disease. So you say you have been bewitched. Tell the patient, the, the person who is suffering, you say you have been bewitched because you don't know what the problem is. So our leaders, in the case of Uganda, they said we are Catholics. So the Catholics formed a Catholic party called DP, Democratic Party, but Democratic for the Catholics. The other group, the Protestants, formed a party called UPC, Uganda People's Congress. One of the tribes, the Baganda, formed a party called Kabaka Yeka. Kabaka is the, the, the chief king of Buganda. So, Uganda was paralyzed. Not only paralyzed, but endangered by this misuse of identity. We are Catholics, we are Protestants, we are Baganda, we are Chodi, we are this. This I have not seen only in, in Uganda. Sudan here, you are Sudan, was broke up by this problem because your, your people in the north, they said they were Arabs. When you look at them, you try to see how, how Arab they are, you don't see it. You see a black man saying he's an Arab. But, but, but I don't see your Arabism. You no, know, I am an Arab. Okay, that's your problem. I remember we tried to negotiate, to mediate between John Garang and uh, Ar Ar Haj. I was involved in that. Why do you insist on your identity? at the expense of other people. Why don't you make the whole of the Sudan neutral as far as identity is concerned? I remember one time I gave them the example of uh, a student dormitory. When you are staying in a dormitory, in some schools you have some cubicles. Cubicles are small rooms where students two or three stay. But then they have a common room, a common room where they gather. 
There are things they can do in the in their cubicle, but with, which they should not do in the common room here. The common room should be for the radio, for the TV. These days, at that time, there was no TV. It was many radios for the newspapers. Then your own things, brushing your teeth and all that, you do it in your in your cubicle. But you come here in the common room, you start brushing your teeth. We are not interested in in, in brushing your teeth. It's not our 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 common interest. But the issue of identity eventually broke up the Sudan. In fact, in one of the meetings, we eager put it. We put it to Field Marshal Bashir. We called it DOP, Declaration of Principles. We say either you choose a Sudan which is secular, which does not talk about your religion and your tribe, talks about to all Sudanese, or you allow the Southerners to go away. It was called self-determination. And Bashir chose the latter. Said. Let them go. I cannot compromise on my identity. So this misuse of identity is a very big poison. But the second problem, yes, in some cases identity can be important, like in the case of, of, of the Sudan. Because in 1961, when I went to the secondary school, I met youth from South Sudan who were in Uganda as refugees. And I asked them, why are you running away? They said the, 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 the Arabs are killing us. They don't allow us to speak our language. They don't allow us to practice our culture. I was mobilized. I was so angry. Who can stop me from speaking my language? Who? Who can do it? You are looking for trouble to stop me to speak my language? Who are you? Are you God? So from that time, I knew that there was a problem of identity in the Sudan here. And it had to be solved. It could have been, could have been solved, but they, they didn't solve it. In South Africa, we had a problem of identity. Because the whites said, Africans cannot vote because they don't know how to vote properly. If we give them a vote, we will misuse it. We better stop. They should not be allowed to vote. And for, for, for almost a century, we on that issue. At one time, they were even saying that uh, Africans cannot go to certain bars, certain toilets. So I asked the, the, the blacks, why do you fight for the toilets for, for, for the whites? If they want to have their own toilets, why do you... What privilege is it to sit on the same toilet with a white man? How does it improve my, 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 my status, my welfare? Therefore, in the case of South Sudan, in the case of Sudan here, in the case of South Africa, the issue of, in the case of the United States, you remember our African people there, the black people, who are being discriminated in the United States, couldn't ride in, 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 in certain buses. So in some cases, the problem of identity becomes serious and it needs to be addressed. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. There is an identity crisis in Africa right now, mainly in Sudan. Sudan's a huge identity crisis, and it's not only Sudan, but it's all throughout the region of Africa. There's an identity crisis. I know it. We know it when we see it. And Museveni is touching, pinpointing Sudan for a reason. Because, I mean, if it, Sudan is looking at altering the map right now of Africa, literally. And when I say Sudan, I mean, many people think of it as a desert uh, land in a faraway distance. But the truth is, it's a major country with over 50 million people. So why are they not magnifying this war that's happening in Sudan right now, like that of the Ukraine or that of Israel? Could it be because the country is poor and they don't matter? Whatever the case may be, I want you all to decide on what is going on there. Because when I read this article about Sudan, uh, let me just show you. Courthouse News Service, Washington. The U.S. issued sanctions on top parliamentary commanders leading the war in Sudan on Wednesday as the specter of the bloody battle looms with no end in sight to the conflict. U.S. sanctions RSF commanders over civilian deaths in Darfur. Sudan, a country of nearly 50 million people, has been mired in a civil war since April 2023. The conflict broke out on the cusp of a Western-brokered transition to democracy between the dual-rooting Sudanese armed forces and the Rapid Support Forces Parliamentary. So with that red, Sudan has over 50 million people. I mean, Israel only has 9.5 million people and Palestine has 5.5 million people. So between Israel and Palestine, both, you have 15 million, when in Sudan alone, you have 50 million people. And the, and the media, cameras, eyes, and the ears of the media, the world meditating on displacement and killings within that region of the Middle East, a region of 480 million people in total when in the Middle East, when in Africa, the population is 1.4 billion people and there's not a camera to be found or, or a comment to be had, make it make sense because right now it just isn't adding up. It doesn't make sense. Let me know what you think. And let me go on with this article. It's really interesting. U.S. sanctions RSF commanders as violence intensifies in Sudan's El Fashar. While the United Nations estimate at least 16,000 people have been killed, 
That number is likely far too low because the country is too dangerous for international observers. So while we look at those numbers of the people that were killed in Sudan, uh, as the numbers they know about, 16,000, a shallow estimate on what we can now verify, only verify through limited sources, that number could be double or triple that. We don't know. And we see the number of those killed in Palestine are 35,173. We got them, we, as we get accurate figures on that. In both cases, it's devastating, tragic, and should bring sorrow and concern to anyone with a heart. I mean, but, but where, is the where is the legitimate concern for the Sudanese people caught in the middle of the same problem of that of Israel and Palestine? Really, this is, this is the difference of a country without money and a country with lots of money. It's not about the bodies, it's about the money. Let me, tell me I'm wrong. I mean, I don't see any protesting going on right now about the Sudanese people over there in that land. I don't even see any leaders in the continent of Africa standing up to protect the rights of their own people of the motherland. It makes me wonder, where are the true African leaders? Which is why I think I'm seeing Museveni right now talking about identity crisis in Sudan. I see puppets otherwise. Otherwise, I see puppets playing to the beep of the media. Palestine, free Palestine, free Palestine. I mean, Kenya wants to get involved in Haiti's mess, even. South Africa and a dozen 40 other African countries are yelling and screaming, free Palestine. When, when there is a greater war going on right in their own backyard. It's so silent we hear crickets. I've only just begun here. Let me know what you think down below. We'll go forward on this, this uh, article. It's fascinating. U.S. issues New Sudan sanctions as bloody battle looms. In just one city, Darfur, for example, media reports say between 10,000 and 15,000 people have been killed. Between 10, hold, hold on, between 10,000 to 15,000 people killed in just one city. This makes the massacre in Gaza Strip, the 1,250 people that were massacred in the Gaza, it looks like child's play. Where's the uproar? Where is the armies to defend such an atrocity? There's the media footage on that, on that, or where's the media footage on this? Where are the leaders of the continents? Oh, I, yeah, I, I, I forgot. They're all at the UN Council meeting, whining and dining on champagne and caviar, talking about Israel during appetizers, Palestine during lunch, and a bit of Ukraine for dinner. So the next time we see a great speech of Palestinian genocide from Africa leader, Let's remind them that they should focus a little more on Africa during dinner at the UN. So thank you, Museveni, for pointing this out. Let's move on. Meanwhile, there are worries about the renewed Darfur genocide as the parliamentary group, which evolved from the militias that carried out the infamous slaughter of the mid-2000s, perpetuates ethnic violence in the region. More than 9 million people have been forced to flee their homes, while around 25 million, more than half the country's population, need humanitarian assistance. Nine million people forced to leave their homes. Let that sink in for a moment. That's almost twice the population in all of Palestine. But show me one of those crying fathers and mothers of the crying baby or crying babies who have been left out for dead. Show me one on the media, like they've been pointing it on the news. This is the identity crisis. They can't show us anything. They can't because these people don't have money, therefore nobody cares. Feel free to tell me I'm wrong, and if, I, if 25 million people need humanitarian assistance, then where is it? Where's China? Where's, where's Russia? Where's India? Where's the US and France and England? Countries who love and the underserved communities of the world. Where are they? If the cameras aren't there, nobody is... If the cameras aren't there, nobody. There's nobody, which is why we're here shedding light on this right now. People, please help us share it. 25 million people in Sudan in need of humanitarian assistance. That's almost 10 times more than that in Palestine. Wow. Identity crisis in Sudan. Identity crisis in the world. As of May 2024, 3.3 million people in the Gaza Strip and the West Banks need humanitarian assistance. This includes 2.2 million people in Gaza and 900,000 people in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Wednesday's sanctions targeted two RSF commanders, Ali Yagub Gabriel and Osman Mohammed Hamid Mohammed, 
for their role in leading the operations in Darfur. The sanctions come amid international worry about an RSF offensive on the North Darfur city of Al Fashar, typically home to half a million people but sheltering more than one million. It's currently controlled by the Sudanese armed forces and is one of the only cities the parliamentary hasn't seized in the region. While the Sudanese people continue to demand an end to this conflict, these commanders have focused on expanding to new fronts and battling for control of more territory, said Brian Nelson, Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence at the Treasury Department. The United States will continue to use sanctions to support the peace process and act against those on either side who further perpetuate the conflict. Beyond the ethnic violence, aid agencies have warned of impending famine as harvest yields have dropped, grain prices have increased, and the flow of humanitarian assistance has been stymied by the army. The leaders of the SAF and RSF and their affiliated militias face a choice. Escalate the violence and perpetuate the suffering of their people while risking the disintegration of their country or seize attacks. Allow unhindered humanitarian access and prepare in good faith for negotiations to end this war and restore power to the people of Sudan, the State Department said in a statement. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia have tried to mediate talks between the warring factions, but negotiations have consistently broken down. Tom Perriello, who was appointed in February as a special envoy to Sudan, is in the region to advance peace efforts. The current crisis traces back to 1989, when Omar al-Bashir took over the country in a military coup. The Sudanese people eventually toppled his regime in a popular uprising in 2019. That uprising gained the support of the SAF and RSF, who shared power with the civilian leaders in a transitional government meant to lead the Sudan to democracy. But that transition was delayed when the army and parliamentary ousted civilian leaders in 2021. U.S. Department of State has just came out with a media report sanctioning Sudanese Rapid Support Forces commanders. Of marginalization, of underdevelopment, of dictatorships, of civil wars, of failed states, of starvation and death, of refugees, all of these have been happening in the last 500 years to the Africans. So with that read and with all we've said, and with the Museveni speech going into the Sudan area now of Africa, once Sudan gets liberated and once Sudan gets free by the Africans, from the Africans, it's going to be a whole new season in that area. I think the Middle East wants that area. I don't know. Maybe the Arabs are saying we belong here. It was our land before it was yours. And the Africans are saying, no. I don't think so. It was our land first. And they're going to go back in the history to find their identity. One thing I just want to say about identity real quick. I, I, I get it. I get the identity thing. I, I remember, there, but there's one thing that I see a lot here in Florida, especially in America. In Florida, it's the Cuban flag. Cubans everywhere. I mean, Miami is, they call it little Cuba. Uh, I mean, there's, we have, and they're the most wonderful people that you'll ever want to meet. They're, they're just great. I have a lot of friends that are just, they're fascinating. And, uh, but uh, one of my buddies was driving down his car. He got a little pimping thing going on with his little Honda Civic. And he's got his Cuban flag up there, his Cuban bumper sticker and, you know, stickers on his car, Cuban, Cuban, Cuba, Cuba. It's like, all right. No, I, I, I never said anything to him, but I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I don't get it. Why do we try so hard? to be who we already are. We know who we are. I mean, I get the fly and flag here, but, and, but we know who we are. But we try so hard to be who we already are. Maybe we should try a little less hard being who we are from the place we're at and try harder being more like the person God made us to be. Anyway, let me know what you think about the video. Let me know you, what you think about this identity crisis thing that Museveni has brought up to, to us and, uh, and pretty much shined a light on it. Thank you, Yari Museveni. I appreciate your wisdom and your, and your understanding with what's going on in the world right now. And I just uh, I pray for Africa, Africa's safety, Africa's revolution that's going on right now. I'm just excited about it as you are one love. We are one love and he is love. So ladies and gentlemen, like, subscribe, and I will see you on the next one. Have a blessed night. Bye-bye.